Hi there. Uh, my name is Hassan Salam. I uh, am a professor in uh, obstetric and gynecology at the University of Alexandria in Egypt. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, fibromyomata, also called fibroids or leomyomata. Fibroids are really uh, the most common benign tumors in women. They arise from the uterus and particularly from the myometer, from the muscle of the uterus. They are called fibroids. They are more specifically called fibromyomata because they consist of fibrous tissues and also of, of uh, muscle uh, fibers. And they also they are sometimes called leomyomata. Uh, how prevalent are they? They are present about 20 to 50 percent of women uh, aged 30 years or more. It depends, of course, on the study you're looking at. Some studies put them uh, at 20 uh, percent, others are more common up to 50 percent, and it depends of course on which population you're looking at. So what are the risk factors? Well, fibroids are more common in laliparous women, women who have never been pregnant before, or women who are of low parity. They're also common in obese women, and women with a family history of fibroids. They're also uh, more common in black women, and they are associated with hyperstrenemia. So what are the types of fibroids? Well, fibroids can generally be divided into the corporeal fibroids, which arise from the body of the uterus, and cervical fibroids, which arise from the uterine cervix. Now, the corporeal fibroids can be subdivided into the subserous types, the submucous types, and the intramural types. The subserous types, which are mainly outside the, uh, the uterus cell, the mucus, which are inside the cavity of the uterus and intramural in the wall of the uterus. And again, the same with the cervix. If they are in the wall of the cervix, we call them the true cervical fibroids. Or if they are uh, inside the cervical canal, we call them cervical polyps. And there are also the pseudo cervical, which extend outside the cervix, which means that they will be uh, located between the two leaves uh, or leaflets of the broad ligament. We call them pseudo cervical fibroids. Uh, and these are the corporeal fibroids. Uh, the fibroid can be inside the wall of the uterus, so it's intramural, like we see in the middle panel, or it can be inside the cavity of the uterus, arising from the endometrium, like our suspended from the endometrium. Uh, so uh, we'll call it a submucous fibroid, uh, like we see on the left panel. And on the right panel, we will see the subserous fibroid, uh, which is uh, um, outside uh, the body uh, of the uterus. These are the corporeal fibroids. In fact, the FIGO, the International Federation of Obstetric and Gynecology, have made a subclassification of fibroids, or leomyomata, as you can see here. Uh, in the submucous mucous, uh, group, um, these can be either 0, 1, or 2. So if they are completely uh, pedunculated inside the uterine cavity, uh, so they will take uh, classification zero. Uh, if they are also uh, submucous, but uh, mostly submucous, and less of 50% of them are intramural, they will be uh, called uh, class one. Then if uh, more than 50% is intramural and the rest is intracavitary, they will be classified as class two. Uh, now, class 3, uh, from 3 to 8, are other uh, uh, classes. Uh, 3, uh, it, it is when the um, fibroid is intramural, but it touches the uh, endometrium, as you can see uh, in uh, the picture, in the diagram. 4, uh, when they are totally intramural, they don't touch either the external wall of the uterus or the internal wall of the uterus. Five, they are subserosal. They touch the external uh, wall of the uterus. Actually, they uh, protrude a little bit, but less than 50% of them is outside uh, the myometrium. And six, when more than 50% of them are outside of the myometrium, they are still uh, my, um, intramural, but most of them are outside. Now, seven, are totally subserosal, as you can see, they are pedunculated subserosals, and then they have left the class A for other um, um, types of fibroids, including the cervical fibroids and the parasitic fibroids, which um, are attached to other uh, 
uh, organs in the pelvis. And then finally, there is what we call group 2-5. And this means that the fibrose is both submucous and subserosal. It occupies the three classification. It is intramural, but it has a little bit which protrudes inside the uterine cavity and another bit which protrudes outside uh, the uterine uh, cavity. So it's 2-5. Now, the, uh, as you can see, another uh, presentation of the fibroids, as you can see here, we have the submucous uh, fibroid polyp, we have the submucous only, then we have the subserous, and then we have the intramural. And then, again, we have uh, pedunculated subserous. Uh, but the other types of fibroids are the broad ligament, because uh, the, fibro the intramural fibroids, if they are in the body of the uterus and they go between the two leaflets, of the broad ligament, uh, they will be broad ligament uh, fibroids. And then we have the cervical fibroids. And as you can see here, we have spoken about the corporeal fibroids, the upper panel of this uh, diagram, as you can see. Uh, but let's look at the lower uh, panel of this diagram, uh, the cervical fibroids. Uh, there are what we call the true cervical fibroids, as we can see. And the pedunculated cervical fibroid, the fibroid may have a pedicle and then uh, protrudes beyond the cervix and it will be a pedunculated cervical fibroid. Because there is also the pseudo cervical fibroids, which are not shown in this diagram, but which uh, is a cervical fibroid, a true cervical fibroid, which extends between the two leaflets of the broad ligament and then it will be called a pseudo cervical fibroid. So this is, again, the classification of fibroids, the types of fibroids. We have the corporeal, which can be subserous, submucous, or intramural. And we have the figure classification. Then we have the cervical, which can be true cervical, uh, totally inside the wall of the cervix, or cervical polyp, protruding inside, uh, outside the, the, the cervical canal with uh, a pedicle. And then we have a pseudocervical, which extends between the two ligaments of the broad ligament. So what is the pathology or pathophysiology? Uh, now these are nodular structures. They are oval or rounded, as you can see on the left side, and they can have different sizes. They also can be also single or multiple. They are firm in consistency. And they are, when we cut them into cut section, you find that they were word appearances, appearance. And they uh, vary in size, as we said, from tiny seedlings to huge abdominal masses. So how do the fibroids arise? Now, as you can see from this uh, diagram, it starts with a myometrial stem cell, and it is transformed into fibroid stem cell. And this occurs because of some genetic aberrations. So some genes play, uh, play a role, and this is why there is a familiar uh, family history in many of the patients with fibroids, and also they are more common in certain races like uh, black women then these fibroid stem cells are transformed into uterine uh, uh, fibroid cells, the myomata cells. And this occurs because of proliferation and angiogenesis and also the extracellular matrix uh, uh, deposition. And why does this happen? Under different uh, effects. Uh, gonadal steroids, estrogens, of course, play an important role. As we said, they are associated with hyperstrenemia. Uh, which means usually there is a lower uh, level progesterone. Uh, they are associated with growth factors. Growth factors also play a role. The uh, transforming growth factor uh, beta and the uh, uh, intra uh, um, insulin like growth factor uh, factors and also the epidermal uh, growth factor and uh, uh, catenines also and so on. And finally, hypoxia also is thought to play a role in transforming the fibroid stem cells into uterine uh, fibroid cells. So what is the clinical presentation? How does the patient with fibroid uh, present? Number one, which we should always remember, is that it can be asymptomatic. Uh, many women may have fibroids and they don't have any symptoms and therefore they don't need any treatment. But the important presentations are bleeding. Many women with fibroids come with bleeding, heavy menstrual bleeding. And also, they may have pain. 
uh, particularly if there is uh, uh, some changes that occur in this fibroid called the important part, the red generation, red genera degeneration, which is a form of congestion inside the fibroid. And then some women come uh, with infertility, and then we discover that they have a fibroid, and we think that the fibroid is the cause of the infertility because it is not always the cause. Then some women come complaining of leukorrhea, particularly if there is a submucous uh, fibroid polyp, uh, which is uh, leading to a uh, discharge, which is usually uh, a transparent discharge uh, without color, without odor. Uh, some women may uh, complain of pressure symptoms, particularly if it is a fibroid pressing on the bladder, on the ureter, or the rectum. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, it can just be an abdominal swelling. Again, uh, if the fibroid is uh, quite uh, big, then the woman may actually feel it and see it uh, as an abdominal swelling. So, as I said, infertility uh, is associated with some fibroids, but it is not. Uh, not all women with fibroids will have infertility. Many women can become uh, pregnant and have many babies uh, in the presence of fibroids. And this is something that we have to remember. But uh, can infertility uh, can fibroids lead to infertility? Yeah, in some cases it can. Uh, of course, we said uh, that as fibroids are associated with hyperesthesia and uh, low progesterone. This is mean. This means that these women uh, may have ovulatory disorders and they may need proper uh, induction of ovulation. The second cause of this infertility may be that the fibroid is doing a mechanical tubal occlusion as we can see from this diagram. And again, another cause of fibroid is that it can prevent implantation because it is a submucous fibroid. It acts as um, a foreign body inside the uterus, like an intrauterine device, for example. And again, it can affect the endometrium itself, preventing the embryo from implanting inside the uterus. So how can we diagnose fibroids? Of course, like any diagnosis, we have the uh, we have the symptoms, we have asked the patient, the family history, and so on. Then we have our examination, the general examination. Uh, there isn't much that we can see with general examination, but of course, by bimanual examination, we can uh, find that the patient has a fibroid. Now, we always call it a bimanual examination. We don't like to call it vaginal because it is not only one uh, a finger or one hand. We have to compress the uterus between our two hands to uh, get a sense of the size of the uterus, therefore detecting if there is a fibroid or not. Then if we think that there is a fibroid, we do our investigations. Uh, there are, of course, laboratory investigations that we can do, but the important thing is the ultrasound. Today, gynecological ultrasonography is very important in our diagnosis. Uh, as we will see now, we can also resort to sonohysterography or hysterosalpingography, Sometimes we need to do an MRI or a hysteroscopy and even laparoscopy, and let's look uh, how. So uh, in terms of uh, um, laboratory tests, the important thing, of course, is the hemoglobin. The patient comes and she says, I have heavy bleeding. And uh, of course, every woman is her normal. Uh, some, for some women, uh, this excessive, this amount of bleeding is excessive. For others, it is not that excessive. Um, so uh, what can tell us exactly whether the woman has anemia or not is to measure hemoglobin, of course. And uh, what is very important is to do a vaginal ultrasound, because today vaginal ultrasound is an integral part of our examination, and it will tell us whether the patient has a fibroid or not. Uh, this is the 2D ultrasound, two-dimensional ultrasound. As you can see, this is a, a transverse section of the uterus showing uh, a fibroid uh, inside, taking, uh, protruding from uh, the wall of the uterus. Again, another fibroid uh, seen here by vaginal sonography, and we see the uterus on the right, see the individual, and then we see the fibroid there. We may also need, as I said, to do sonohysterography, meaning that we inject saline or some sorts of uh, um, echolucent fluid, like uh, hycosy, for example. And this can show us that this patient has subuterine polyps, as you can see in this uh, ultrasound picture. 
and 3D and 4D ultrasound uh, can of course show us a better picture of the fibroids and exactly where they are, how they are compressing the uterus and so on, as you can see from these two uh, pictures of uh, 3D, 4D uh, ultrasound. Another one here showing uh, some mucus uh, fibroid um, clearly uh, present inside the uterine cavity shown here again by 3D, 4D ultrasound. Uh, sometimes we need to do a Doppler study because, as you will say later, uh, some uh, it may be, uh, it may not be a fibroid. In very rare cases, it can be a sarcoma, and then uh, this will be important um, to differentiate because sarcoma, of course, is a malignant uterus, uh, um, tumor of the uterus. It is very rare, but it can happen, and then uh, it is also a good idea. Uh, always a good idea to do a Doppler study of uh, the polyp or the fibroid to see if there is a lot of uh, blood supply inside this uh, tissue. And again, it's important to look at the individual thickness because it will tell us about uh, the uh, amount of bleeding, for example, this uh, lady is uh, having. And again here, another Doppler, Doppler study of the individual and the myometrium, and it is too very excessive here, uh, which is really a very suspicious uh, sign. Uh, sometimes we need to do hysterosarcopenography, as I said, if we suspect of having um, some mucus fibroid, which we cannot see maybe uh, clearly with ultrasound or even with 3D, 4D ultrasound. So this will show us, as you can see on the left side, there is a some mucus fibroid, and on the right side there is a small fibroid which is obstructing probably uh, the tube and leading to unilateral tubular obstruction at least, which may play a role in the infertility problem of this woman. Uh, sometimes we need to look with a hysteroscope to see whether we have a polyp there or not, which maybe the ultrasound would suggest that we have a polyp, but to make sure we do a hysteroscope. And then at the same time, we can remove this submucous fibro polyp. As you can see in the lower panel on the left side, this is the normal uh, picture of uh, that we can see with hysteroscopy with the two uterine ostia, the tubal ostia, as you can see. And on the right side, we have a submucous fibro. Of course, the, the picture is very much enlarged uh, by hysteroscope. So this polyp on the right side can only be a one centimeter uh, polyp, but yeah, it gives you the uh, sense that it is a little bit uh, larger than you would expect. Uh, laparoscopy also can help us in uh, diagnosing um, a lesion which is arising from the uterus. Again, we don't know. Uh, maybe the ultrasound doesn't suggest very much. So on occasions, you may need to have a uh, to do a laparoscopy to uh, make sure that this is a fibroid, and sometimes even uh, to remove it with laparoscopic surgery. Magnetic resonance again may sometimes be needed again if we are not sure of our diagnosis. As you can see here, on the left side we have a pundal fibroid, on the right side we have a submucous fibroid. Uh, as you can see in both pictures. Uh, the back of the woman is on the right, and then you have the sacral bones, as you can see the sacrum, the lumbar bones, the lower lumbar, and then the sacrum. And then we have the on the left side, for example, we have the fibroid, which is compressed by a full bladder in this case. <clears throat> and on top of this uh, um, uterus, there is a fibroid uh, in panel A, while in panel B, it is the, uh, there is a, f f a uterus, which is... Um, enlarged and it has gone up and then inside this uterus there is a submucous fibroid a big submucous fibroid uh, which you can see with this arrow with a white arrow fine so enough for these for the methods of uh, diagnosis we have also to remember that there are possible complications of course the first one is anemia if the woman has heavy menstrual bleeding, then she will have anemia. What is anemia is when the hemoglobin is less than 11 grams per deciliter, according to WHO anyway. So uh, this is usually uh, iron deficiency anemia. 
Another possible complication is what we call a degeneration. There are two important degenerations, the red degeneration and the higher line degeneration. The red degeneration is due to congestion, to congestion of this fibro. It typically happens in the mid-trimester of pregnancy, leading to local pain and tendons, and sometimes fever and leukocytosis. The woman comes with pain uh, uh, on, side, and on top of her uterus, and this is we probably know from before that she has a fibroid, so we have to think about the red degeneration of the fibroid. Another degeneration is the high line degeneration uh, due to inadequate blood supply, uh, which leads to uh, cystic degeneration. So there is uh, a lack of blood supply, so the blood does not reach uh, the fibroid, and then you will have the degeneration in the um, center of the fibroid. Twisting can also happen, and this can also happen during the mid trimester pregnancy, especially, of course, it happens in pedunculated subthesis fibroids. So uh, the, the, the fibro twists along itself and then they can lead to a case of acute abdomen uh, with pain uh, and so on. It needs to be uh, reverted either with a laparoscope if the pregnancy is still in its beginning or sometimes we may need to do a laparotomy and remove this uh, twisted uh, subnucleus fibroid, subserous fibroid. Classification is another uh, possibility uh, or calcified degeneration, you may call it, but calcification, uh, but it is usually discovered accidentally by ultrasound or x ray. And finally, uh, malignant change, as we said, is very rare. It is less than one in 200, so it's uh, five and a thousand cases that you will find uh, malignant change. So it is not, it is quite rare, and this is, has something is to be put in mind. So we have made the diagnosis of fibroid. So what do we do? As I said at the beginning, no symptoms, no treatment. Many of women who do have a fibroid and, do, and the fibroid is discovered accidentally. So in this case, there's no need to do anything. No, no symptoms, no treatment. Because as I said, the possibility of being transformed into a malignant tumor is very rare. Medical treatment, again, can be done. Minimal invasive therapy and then uh, surgical treatment, which can be either conservative or uh, definitive. So what is the medical treatment of fibroids? Now, the first thing is to uh, treat the bleeding. The woman is coming to bleeding, so we give her tranexamic acid or non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or any um, uh, treatment that will stop, help stop bleeding uh, without hormones. We also have to treat the anemia. If there's anemia, we have to give iron supplementation because this anemia is usually iron deficiency anemia. So, uh, of course, hemoglobin is not only iron, it is only uh, it's iron plus proteins. So she has to have a good uh, protein diet, but also iron supplementation, of course, which should be given, given orally or parenterally. And sometimes if we are preparing the patient for an operation, for example, or if the hemoglobin is very low, sometimes we need to do blood transfusion or packed RBCs. It's quite rare, but it can happen. And again, uh, if the bleeding does not stop with the, these uh, measures, then uh, we may need to treat this hyperesterinemia, either giving progestogens, uh, drugs which act like progesterone, progesterone or GnRH agonists, which stop FSH coming and LH coming from the pituitary. And there is also the drug called uliprestel acetate, uh, which is not very commonly used now because there was a question of uh, liver affection. So what are the medical treatments used to oppose or diminish the effect of hyperesterinemia? Uh, of course, progesterone or uh, its uh, similar compounds called progestins can oppose the effect of uh, estrogen or estradiol. Uh, and these can be given, of course, by oral administration or intramuscular injections. And there are also the intrauterine devices which contain uh, progesterone like compounds, norgesterone, in fact. There are also the oral contraceptives. Some people use oral contraceptives because they contain an abundance of progesterone and uh, they are uh, easily obtained and in some countries they are even subsidized. Then we can use the long-acting GnRH agonists and these of course act by uh, diminishing 
the secretion of FSH from the pituitary or stopping it altogether. Therefore, um, the estrogen secreted from the ovary is going to diminish, and therefore, uh, because fibroids are estrogen dependent, uh, they can uh, uh, stop from growing and even uh, shrink in uh, some cases. And finally, we have the uripristel acetate, which is a drug. It's, it is actually a selective progesterone receptor modulator, and uh, which acts again by uh, diminishing the size of progesterone of uh, fibroids and um, uh, opposing the effect of uh, estradiol. Then we have the minimal invasive therapy uh, methods, like what? like doing DNC. A patient is coming with uh, heavy bleeding and you want to stop the bleeding as an emergency measure. So you do a DNC. And if there is a polyp, it can be removed by uh, DNC, by dilatation with uretage. But of course, the ideal method of removing the polyp is uh, to remove it under vision uh, by doing hysteroscopic polypectomy. There is another method, which is a minimally invasive method uh, which is uterine artery uh, embolization. And finally, uh, MRI-guided high-intensity focused ultrasound, which is what they call HIFO, <coughs> myolysis. So this is the DNC, dilatation and curature. It is a minor operation, of course. I mean, it requires minimum skills, and uh, during which you can also take a endometrial biopsy. But of course, it has a temporary effect, and there is also uh, the possibility of perforation if the person doing the operation is not uh, expert enough. Hysteroscopic polypectomy, as I said, is to remove the polyp under vision uh, by uh, through a hysteroscope. And again, as you can see on the right side, uh, there is this uh, resectoscope which uh, helps us to uh, remove uh, the polyp either in one piece or maybe even to uh, cut it in small pieces with this uh, resectoscope. Then we have uterine artery embolization, which means that uh, introducing a catheter, usually through a febrile artery, and then under uh, X-ray, it will be guided to the uterine artery, and then uh, some polyvinyl particles are going to be injected, and the idea is to block the uterine artery or the branches of the uterine artery which are supplying this fibroid. And finally, uh, we have this MRI-guided high-intensity focused ultrasound, the HIFO myolysis, as you can see here. The patient is lying on her tummy. Uh, the transducer comes from below, and it produces high-intensity ultrasound uh, waves, which are of high intensity. They are not like the diagnostic ultrasound. They have a very high intensity, so they can break uh, the fibroid leading to myolysis of this fibroid like the machines used for uh, destroying the uh, calculi of uh, the kidneys, for example, uh, for in urology. And finally, of course, we have the surgical options. Now, of course, we start with medical treatment, and if the medical treatment does not, uh, uh, is not satisfactory, we may suggest some form of... Uh, a minimal invasive treatment, but sometimes, as I say, we have to resort to surgical treatments. And these surgical treatments are either conservative or definitive. Conservative meaning what? Meaning that the woman uh, uh, wants to have uh, more children, in which case we will not remove the uterus, we will leave the uterus, but we will only remove the fibroid, which is an operation called myomectomy. And this can be done by open laparotomy or can be done by laparoscopic uh, myomectomy in certain indicated uh, cases. And then we have the definitive treatment when the woman has completed her family, uh, she doesn't have, she doesn't want any more children, uh, bleeding is excessive, and we have to remove the uterus. And when we remove the uterus, sometimes we need to remove a tube and uh, uh, an ovary, which is a unilateral sapingophorectomy, or sometimes we do bilateral sapingophorectomy. And this hysterectomy operation can be done by open abdominal hysterectomy, as I said, by laparoscopic hysterectomy in indicated cases, and laparoscopically assisted vaginal hysterectomy in other cases, and finally by uh, robotic uh, surgery. 
uh, the difference between laparoscopic hysterectomy is that you remove the, the whole of the uterus through, through the um, laparoscope, uh, then how do you remove this big uh, uterus you have just removed? You do uh, uh, morcellation uh, for the fibroid after you have uh, removed it and then you extract it um, in a, a plastic bag like a sausage from the small opening of the laparoscope or as I said laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy which means that you cut the um, uterus loose using the laparoscope and then you uh, open the vagina and you remove the, the uh, uterus from uh, the vagina. So it is really a vaginal hysterectomy which is preceded by uh, laparoscopic uh, steps. So myomectomy, what do we do in the myomectomy? We, it is, of course, as we said, it is done to preserve future fertility. Uh, but we have to remember that it, is, it can be a bloody operation. Therefore, we use a tourniquet when we are we're working. We compress the uterus, we compress the uterine arteries as well as the ovarian arteries, uh, the uterine arteries and the ovarian arteries. Uh, we cannot do this forever, of course, because the blood supply uh, cannot be stopped from the uterus for a long time. So sometimes also we inject the vasopressin, uh, which is the antidiuretic hormone, which is also uh, will lead us to, to diminution of the congestion inside the uterus while we are working and uh, make the operation less bloody. And of course, it is always a good idea to prepare blood uh, for the patient because this operation can be bloody. Then when we do our operation, it is always a good idea to do our incisions in the anterior wall and then go uh, to remove the fibroids even if they are on the posterior aspect of the uterus because we don't like to leave scars on the posterior wall of the uterus which is near the tubes and the ovaries therefore uh, it may uh, produce adhesions which can uh, affect uh, the future fertility and as i said this can be performed by open laparotomy or by laparoscopy and uh, uh, we have to remember that many of these patients finally uh, require a hysterectomy later in life because usually the fibroids is not only it's rare to have a single fibroid uh, you remove the big ones and then the rear, you leave behind some small ones within, which in the future are going to grow and maybe give a further bleeding later in life and then many of these women end up having a hysterectomy afterwards but at least they will have completed their family. And this is the abdominal hysterectomy. As I said, we can remove the uterus and leave the cervix which is called the subtotal hysterectomy. And then the total hysterectomy, we remove the uterus and the cervix, as you can see on the right side. And in the lower panel, as you can see, this, was, this is a total hysterectomy with the removal of both tubes and both ovaries. So it is a total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, oophorectomy, as you can see uh, in this diagram. And here's laparoscopic hysterectomy, as I said, you can see in panel A, uh, the surgeon is uh, obstructing, is, is uh, putting a tie uh, on uh, between the uterus and the ovarian ligament and the round ligament and between them the fallopian tube. Then he will cut and uh, leave it loose as, you, as we said before. So he's done it here on the left side in panel A, and then in panel D, he is repeating what he has done on the, in panel A, and then the uterus will be cut loose. So either he will remove, he cut this, the lower part of the uterus, separate it from the vagina, and then remove it uh, after morcellation, uh, like a, a sausage, as I said, or make an opening in the vagina and transform it into a laparoscopically assisted vaginal hysterectomy. And of course, this can be done with uh, the robot, the so-called robotic surgery. As you can see here, the surgeon is sitting on the console on the left side. Uh, he is uh, playing with the, using the joysticks to move the instruments while his assistant is standing and the nurse are standing beside the patient and the different instruments have been introduced inside the abdominal cavity of the patient and everybody can see on the screen, the nurse can see on the screen and the assistant while the surgeon himself 
and see everything on the console. Finally, I would like to say that this presentation should be seen in conjunction with my other presentation on abnormal Deuteran bleeding, uh, particularly uh, in the area of management with more details uh, presented in. So with this, I come to the end of this presentation and I would like to thank you very much for your attention.